Welcome to I Found This Great Book. My name is Curtis, and today I have such a pleasure and such a great gift to bring you. Oh my God. I'm going to have a book discussion <laughs> with two of my favorite podcasters, two folks who. So I want you to imagine that the two coolest people in school take over your literature class. Okay, see, you, and you're giving us so much. Suddenly, <laughs> that dry old book comes to life. And that's what happens every time you listen to Marcy and Akko of the Colored Pages Book Club. Marcy oh and Akko. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, we are here. We are here. Thank you, Curtis, because that was that one hell of an intro. Um, my my word, we are so happy to be yeah. here. Thank you so much for having us. Ah, uh, so sweet. I just imagine um Marcy and I walk into a classroom and they're like, "We're reading the Scarlet Letter," and we like take their book and we throw it across the room. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> no. <laughs> and, like there's like Technicolor lights and like we're wearing like platform sneakers and it's just yes. yeah we have this whole <laughs> we just go. do a, a whole to do. But um, the students are like, "Where did that disco ball come from?" Exactly. It's like, <laughs> did y'all rehearse? Situation. And we're just like, we're just like on, <laughs> just on the beat, like. <laughs> We have a I disco like ball Curtis that follows principal. follows us around when we go and make our appearances. We got our own exactly. just shows up. Right. You can find Marcy and Akko at www.thesecoloredpages.com. Their mm-hmm. site is really cool. So when you go to this site, you can see all their podcast episodes. They got a bunch of collaborations and you need to go to the site. Also, you can follow them on Twitter at the colored pages. And on Instagram at the colored pages. I will have those links in the show notes and also on my website, I found this great book.com. So you definitely want to check them out. I'm telling you, you, they make literature fun a whole lot. There's a lot of shenanigans that be going on when they talk about books. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Be some serious shenanigans. <laughs> yeah, or shenaniganery, as Akko yes. would say. Yes. Um, is, yes. 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 <laughs> Just some nice hijinks and tomfoolery. So, so, yeah. Thank you, Curtis. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's just wild. Right. It's so wild to, like, hear you talk about our show. Because it's, it's like, it's like you know, I do the show with Akko. We love it. But, I don't know, sometimes it's like, okay, like, a, it's like, even though clearly we're putting this on the internet and, like, clearly it's, like, for public consumption, like, we're just... <laughs> I'm just like, oh, I'm just talking to Akko like every week mm-hmm. about right. a book. Like it just feels very like intimate. And then it's like we talk to you and I'm like, oh, we're just having a three way call. And it's like, this is going on the internet. Like yeah. people are gonna listen. Like it's just <laughs> and so yeah, so it's so wild hearing people talk about the show. But but you've always been such a great just supporter and men- mentor and like mm-hmm. I don't know. I just yeah. I, I just really enjoy the, the the fact that we met through this medium and like I'm just yes. I'm, I'm excited for today and just excited for just all the collaborations coming forward because we definitely I we gonna make this a thing regularly. Cause I have another Crazy. book in mind for later, maybe maybe beginning of next year. Oh yes. And then I'm mean, you talk about oh, shenanigans. Yeah. This see, this will be the perfect book to work with you going. Oh this, wait, hold on. Wait. Shenanigans, <laughs> but I'm gonna I'm let everybody. Excited. They're gonna have to wait because we're gonna. So before we get to that, <clears throat> what we're doing <laughs> is we're starting a journey through the <laughs> novels of Jesse Redmond Fawcett. And you might say, well, who was that? Well, she is a writer and she is very, very pivotal in the Harlem Renaissance. She was one of the early editors of the Crisis Magazine, which was the magazine mm-hmm. of the NAACP. She edited basically all the greats of the Harlem Renaissance, and she put a lot of them mm-hmm. on. The Crisis Magazine was the first magazine to publish a work by Langston Hughes. Um, Ooh, and she wow. was there and did that and mm-hmm. had a gigantic impact on people. And I found out about her. It's not like I knew her. I was listening to another podcast called New Books and African American Studies, and I'm going to have the links in the show notes Mm -hmm. and that podcast had an episode called the middle world race performance and the politics of passing and Mm -hmm. dr julia s charles was the main guest and she was talking about how the the idea of passing played out in so much literature Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, once black people could actually publish and get their books published. Mm -hmm. And at the end, you know, they said, well, what else are you doing? And she said, well, I'm working on a biography of um, Jesse Redmond Fawcett. And she started talking a little bit about who she was. And I said, I never heard of her. And I said, well, let me go see if her books are out there. Maybe, you know, I'm thinking you can't find it. You have to go to maybe mm -hmm. some old copy or maybe somewhere on the Internet mm -hmm. Archive. And no, all her books mm -hmm. are in publication. I said, oh, my gosh. And there's four books. And uh, I said, wow, this is cool. I want to talk about this on my podcast. And then I said, well. I, me just talking about it won't have that much impact. So I said, but it will be great if I could have discussions with mm -hmm. folks I know. And oh, I so, you know, that. the first two people I thought of, Professor <laughs> uh, Marcy and <laughs> Dr. Akko. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, well, there's a book called There is Confusion. Ah, yeah, that'll be fun for that time. I don't know what it's about. But so I said, oh, I reached out to Marcy and Akko. And I said, oh, I want to read these books. I said, I'm going to check this out. And they're like, bet. And uh, yeah. there are three other books, Plum Bum. And so I reached out to my friend Alicia, who runs the Pretty Brown Eyed Reader YouTube channel. Nice. And I'm going to discuss that with her in July. In September. Uh, there's uh, not the third book in, that she wrote, The China Berry Tree. And I reached out to Danny and Molly, who run Black Chick Lit. Nice. You yeah. guys know, because you oh have a great collaboration uh, with them. Uh, they're great. Oh. And the final book that she wrote, Comedy American Style, reaching out to um, Tanya Ransom, who runs Nightlight Podcast. And that's a Ooh. podcast dedicated to horror by yes. black authors yes mm -hmm. and i had the pleasure of uh, interviewing her some time ago and i listened to her talking with a an author and she was kind of bringing the author out of their shell to talk about their work and she said yeah but i also like reading besides horror i like reading you know straight literary fiction i said oh mm. well let's see this and she said yes yeah. so this year's project one of my big reading projects is to read and discuss these four books by jesse Redmond Fawcett, and hopefully, in us doing this, we can help people become more aware of her. Mm -hmm. uh, she had a huge impact on the Harlem Renaissance, and her works aren't as well known as Hurston or mm -hmm. Hughes or other people, but as we're finding out, she had some stuff to say. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> enough of me talking. Briefly, uh, There is Confusion is, is a book about a group of young black, I, I think I, I kind of wrap it up to say it's kind of like looking at the first generation that wasn't directly touched by slavery and their mm, movement yeah. through their life. You're looking at people from the late 1800s to early 1900s through the um, first world war. So you look at that time period and it's really fascinating. These are, Black people who were, I guess you would classify them as middle class, who lived mm -hmm. in Philadelphia and Harlem and uh, talking about their lives. And Jesse had stuff to say about their lives. So let's. Oh, she did. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. But Curtis. Yes. Before you get into a full summary. Okay. I have a question. All right. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a running gag on our show for context. Yes. If, if anyone was like, "Why did why did Akko say that?" Like that? <laughs> Rudely interrupt. <laughs> like, no, no, no. I love it. <laughs> um. So for the group, so in this book, there is confusion. There is a pivotal point, which we'll get into, in which one of the characters, Joanne, writes a letter that causes everything to catalyze oh in a God. different mm. direction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My question to you, what is a moment that you either let pass by that you still think about and regret or a moment that you feel catalyzed everything or a lot of things in your life? Oh, my God. Mm. I know. Heavy hitter. That's what's up. Mm. <laughs> mm. Now I got to think what I can say that I can't get sued for. 
<laughs> if you want, I can start. Go ahead. I did throw Go it ahead. out there. Okay. Okay. So I think I've talked about this a little on my our podcast as well. But when I was eight, I think it was between 17 and 18 Mm -hmm. i got this idea in my head to cut off all of my i had a perm all of my permed hair and just cut it all off which this was not to age myself but it was in Mm -hmm. the 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 early 20 teens Mm -hmm. so there was like nothing really on this and i like lived in a town that was very white and Just no one knew what was going on. And I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. That's going to be what I do. And I'm never going to perm my hair again. And this is going to be my life now. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So one day, and I told my family, and they all kind of looked at me in confusion. And (laughs) so one day, I was standing in my bathroom with like a pair of kitty scissors. And I just cut off all of my hair. Mm. Um. And it was the most single, most one of the like most freeing experiences of my life. Mm -hmm. And it catalyzed my life in a completely different direction because from that point on, I feel like I I rejected Western beauty standards or at least started to reject them. Mm -hmm. And um, I did it with like maybe a couple of YouTube video tutorials (laughs) and (laughs) and some like uh, I guess the the uh, bravery you have at 18 Mm -hmm. and I sometimes think about like that is like a moment of divergence and Mm -hmm. who would I have been if I went the other way and I didn't do it so that's fine yeah I wow that's I I, I already know that's so political item Yeah. yeah yeah So, wow. but mm. yeah, I'm ten years strong. Don't regret it. <laughs> yes, I lo- oh, yeah. I live. I love. I love that. Um, yeah. it's so funny. I feel like mine's like kind of like a little silly. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I guess I we're here for it. Okay. Um. So so it's, okay. So I, I'll preface what I'm about to say in that looking back now, I'm like, lol. Like none of this is that serious. But at the, so also mine took place around the same time in high school. Actually, when I was about maybe like 16 17 somewhere between like actually no I, w- I probably would have been 17 so at the time you know i you know growing up i grew up in you know in atlanta and like around that time in high school sort of like middle high school um i was really starting to kind of understand sort of like where i guess my identity is as far as like at that time not necessarily gender more so sexuality um and i was finding that just in general i kind of was just someone who was a bit more like sexually fluid, like just kind of having attractions to people of like various genders. And that was something that I had like understood about myself, like kind of almost instinctually, but like never really knew how to like put it into words because I was like, you know, I I guess my biggest fear was that I'm like, okay, like if I'm like super open with people about the fact that I'm like kind of more sexually fluid, I'm kind of afraid that people might put me in some kind of box. Like they might be like, Oh, or really they might just be like, Oh girl, like you're attracted to guys. Like you're, gay period point blank that's it end of conversation there's no there's no nuance here to be explored and so um that was kind of one of my biggest hesitations and also too just like the pressures of growing up in like a heteronormative society is kind of like oh my god like how does one do this um but i remember my senior year um it would have been it was around it, no it for sure actually okay actually it, it starts before my senior year um so my sophomore year, there was a guy at my in my high school that I had like this huge crush on. Um, I won't say his name, but I used to call him Jelly. Um, and that was like his code name like in school. So like I don't know, I would like talk to my friends and be like, Oh my god, Jelly's coming, like Jelly's coming, like <gasps> like look natural. And like we'd all like try to like look cute and like pose and shit, like just like very like just given all that. Um, look natural. Like I had this I like it. I had this whole thing and like it was just like I had this huge crush on Jelly for like two years, and basically senior year, I was like okay, I'm about to grad. Like, I think around this time it was maybe like January, February. I was like, okay, I'm about to graduate. Like, I know that in the future, like I need, and at this point, like I was pretty open about like my sexuality to my peers, Mm. but like I I felt in, in me, it was like deeply important to express how it is that I felt. Like I was like, you've been having these feelings for two years. I feel like at the very least, and like you and Jelly are friends kind of. So like, why not just give yourself a shot? Like, why not, like, why not validate or honor the way you feel by like, you know, making the way you feel be known you know what i mean like let's honor our attractions and like you know try to actually you know like have a conversation and act on them and so 
it what what ensued next can just it was oh my god i look back and i'm like what the fuck so basically <laughs> instead of just being like oh okay, let me just go up to jelly and be like hey girl like let's talk like i was like oh what if i because we were having like a like a valentine's day like candy gram sale i was like i'll just send jelly an anonymous candy gram and then like oh. somehow through osmosis he'll just know that it was me and i'm like <laughs> marcy you couldn't have j-. okay so of course i send the candy gram and all hell breaks loose basically jelly becomes nancy fucking drew and is like who sent me this shit like i need to find out who sent me this candy gram blah blah blah. and like when he got the candy gram one of my like one of my best friends like was there and like he read the candy gram to her and she immediately knew it was me and she was like Mm. oh my god i cannot believe that he did that and she and he was like what and she was like what um so like (laughs) basically he kind of just put together the clues like day by day and like essentially um like just, I was just hearing through the grapevine that like he was like he like found out it was me. It was like it like weirdly took over like my grade. Like everyone was just like really into the tea and this whole jelly thing. Like motherfuckers who I never spoke to were like, "Girl, were you the one that sent jelly that candy gram?" And I'm like, "What the fuck? Why am I seeing it?" In? Um, long story short, I ended up actually telling him, you know, like, "Oh, the candy gram was from me." Oh, and by the way, like I have this huge crush on you. Like la la. And, you know, it didn't necessarily work out like, he, you know, he didn't feel the same way. But um, it's just so funny because I, I will say in the moment it was painful, but also I felt very like validated and like, OK, like mm. I, you know, like I'm really glad that I like kind of chose to, you know, sort of a braver decision, albeit an extremely yeah. messy one. Like it was, it felt very brave. I think it's cute. Thank you. Yeah. And it's just so it's so funny because I remember at that time being like, oh, when I'm like 30 or 40, I'm, you know, like I want to look back on my life and say that I was the kind of person to like, you know, be this open in high school and blah, blah, blah. And it's funny because, like, now I look back on that whole situation and I'm like, yes, like, I'm glad that I was able to kind of honor my emotions. But, like, me specifically pining for Jelly, Jelly Homest, like, I'm just like, I do not think about Jelly at all. Like, it's just like, like, I literally thought I was about to be pressed about Jelly in 10 years. And I'm like, oh, Miss Honey, Miss Girl, like, that's not, Gelatin is not, we don't, we're not thinking (laughs) about gelatin right now it's only peanut butter on this truly no no one is and like honestly i'm just i'm like it you know it's it's cute but i am proud of you i look at younger me i'm like i am proud of you for for being open and being brave and being like you know what like let me just not only tell jelly but tell jelly and all of atlanta apparently because like everyone seemed to know (laughs) what the tea was but um but yeah so that that was the kind of a decision that felt very like it was. It felt like it was going to be super, super important for like my future self, and it was, but in ways that I at that time didn't necessarily didn't understand or expect. Right. So. Yeah. So yeah. Mm. Okay. That's and wow, both of y'all have such powerful ones. Uh, so, for me, I hope this is following in the question. So, an event occurred, but it took almost forty years for me to make a decision and do something. Um, mm. when I was in college, there was this uh, radio program, uh, Bob Law. He had a radio program. He had kind of like a talk show. Well, it was a talk show. And he had really cool people. I found he had different, it, his show was focused on black people and talking about different events. And I found out about mm-hmm. different people back then, Ivan Van Sertima and different people who were writing black history, black literature, com- uh, things dealing with black people. Mm-hmm. And uh, this was in the 80s, early 80s. And, oh, um, wow. but it took until two, two, two and a half years ago where, well, what happened one day, I, and I used to plan my Sunday around coming back to my room in, my, in the apartment I shared with these guys and uh, come back to my room and listen to that show. That was my big thing. Mm-hmm. And I remember coming back one time. I was ready to listen, turn my little AM radio that tells you uh, <laughs> something. There's Love a bunch that. of people like, what's, what's that? And they're going to Google right now. <laughs> what's that? AM radio. Um, don't, don't clock me for being on Google right now. I was like, you know what? <laughs> right. I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to ask. Like, I'm just going to look it up and now I feel exposed. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> And I went to the channel at that time, and there was music playing. I said, what, am I on the wrong station? What, what, what? And they canceled mm. it. And, you know, they don't tell oh. you. They just canceled. No. I said, oh. And I thought, well, maybe this was just a one-time thing. And I went, next yeah. next, next Sunday? No, it's just music. And it wasn't music I wanted to hear. And I was like, how, how could they take canceled? it away? Yeah. 
Yeah, but, Bob Law. His name's Law. Uh-huh. You can't be the cancel. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Continue. But they did. <laughs> and, you know, I realized, wow, that's how quickly something like that went away. And, and so many times during the course of my life, I would see something that's like, oh, man, this is cool. Black. And a lot of times the stuff that dealt with black people played early in the morning on Sunday on TV mm. <laughs> or mm. whatever. And I used to always complain, I would, you know, be that conscious person who told, no, what happened was we need to do this and this and this and this. But I didn't do anything. And it wasn't until about two and a half years ago, maybe maybe two, eh, three, I guess, where I said, you know what? I could be that person that complains and talks about, ooh, here's a problem. Or I could do something. And I said, I'm going to start talking about books. And at first I was just mm. talking about authors because my wife's an author. And I said, oh, I'll talk about independent authors. But that wasn't really ringing true. You know, and I said, well, no, I'm going to do something more. And that caused me to change what I'm doing here with the the podcast and the website. And I said, okay, I want to build something that only I can cancel where I talk about (laughs) literature by black people and not just the most popular literature. I I want to talk Mm. about mysteries. That's why I built this directory of black mystery authors and, Mm -hmm. and, 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 delve into the works of the Harlem Renaissance. And that's why for the rest of this year, I'm going to be reading Jesse uh, Redmond Fawcett's books because I feel it's important that we take advantage of all the options we had. Back then, I used to think about, oh, we could start a magazine and talk about this stuff, but the cost and Mm -hmm. getting it distributed was impossible. And now we're in a time where the cost of doing the podcast is really nothing. And mm-hmm. once you put it up, anyone in the world could listen to it. The thing you have to do is put the work in and put the energy in. And that's on me. And so that uh, event made me say, okay, Curtis, stop being a person yelling at people who are in the arena fighting the lions and, you know, get down there and go ahead and take up and do your mm-hmm. part, you know? And who knows who's going to hear it? Who knows who's going to like it? But I think about, because of this podcast, I met Marcy and Akko, and we've had the opportunity to collab several times. And each time it's really made an impact on me, and it was a lot of fun, and there was always some shenanigans, and uh, <laughs> it, it just was good. And uh, I appreciate the... Uh, internet friendship we've built and the book friendship we've built and all of that was really because i made a decision to do as opposed to complain Mm. wow i like yours (laughs) i like that i like that it actually took longer like i feel like people think that change will happen quickly especially when you're younger and so for you to be like, no, this inspired me to do something so far in the future. One, it kind of is like, hey, it doesn't matter when you start something. You can start something whenever. Come on. And then two, it's like you never know what will spark. It, like Bob Law probably didn't know he in, inspired mm-hmm. Curtis in any capacity. Mm-hmm. Wherever Bob, Bob is, we don't know. But, mm-hmm. you know, like it's kind of like you're saying with this, like we don't know. Maybe in like 50 years, some like kid writing their book report for school will like call us up and be like you guys were part of the podcast black <laughs> movement of the early mm-hmm. 20s and we'll be like well sit down young young person <laughs> young. <laughs> let me tell you my struggles pull up your orb and uh, let's start recording this <laughs> right exactly <laughs> It's actually a hologram interview. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. Oh my God. Uh, love that. Yeah. yeah. Definitely, definitely agree with everything Aqua said. Yeah. That's just so. Yeah. I just, I, I love narratives and, and examples of folks being like, you know what? I'm going to just do the fucking thing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, and it's just, there's n- like, and just kind of go wherever it takes me. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. I mean, even with our show, it's like, We've met so many people through this process where, I mean, before I was like, hey, girl, you want to do a podcast? And Aka was like, yeah, girl, that <laughs> sounds fun. And like two years later, we're like talking to you and like, you know, just have, I don't know, like, it's like, 
it's it's really shifted a lot of just like yeah personal paradigms of mine as well like just yeah. like i feel so like just having been exposed to the you know the, the you know the types of literature that we read and stuff it's just it's just such a it's a huge game changer and so i i yeah i love folks just being like you know what i'm gonna just do something about it we don't know where we gonna end up but we just gonna do it and yeah. just make that first what step so it. or rather make that first move um yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. Oh my God, Marcy, you just reminded me. I know I said the thing about the hair, which is like a beautiful story. Mm -hmm. But two, actually, Marcy's giving me credit. When Marcy first asked me to do the podcast, I said no Mm -hmm. because I was like, (laughs) I'm gonna, I have to be an adult. Blah blah blah. (laughs) And I had this idea of what that looked like, and I was like, and I, I talked about this in a different interview once, but there was like a moment where I literally had a thought, and I was like, okay, this is kind of a wild adventure. And and I was like, do you want to look back and be the person who said no? Mm. Or do you want to look back and be the person who said yes? And I do really think my life would be very different if I had said no. Or if I, yeah, kept my no answer yes. <laughs> instead uh-huh. of saying yes. Because, yeah, I wouldn't have met Curtis. Like, that would be so sad yeah. already. And there's so much that we've been able to accomplish. So Yeah. So. Definitely. <sighs> I'm so, oh my God, I feel so inspired. This just, yeah, this yeah. is so lovely. Uh, so let's uh, get into the book. Uh, this book follows a group of people, uh, uh, family members and uh, friends who grew up together. I guess the central character, one of them, well, they, they say Joanna is the central character, but mm-hmm. there's so many other people who circle around it, but a lot of it's mm-hmm. kind of around Joanna who's this very driven young lady and uh, her sister, Sylvia, and they're from a nice middle-class family. And then you have Maggie who's came up really poor and Mm -hmm. just wants to be accepted and be fit into society. Um, You have their brother, Philip, and then you have Peter, who's this young man who has a lineage and just couldn't quite get himself in gear. Uh, mm-hmm. He kind of was in gear and not, but he was the love interest of, well, he thought he was the love mm. interest of Joanna. Mm. <laughs> but let's, um, <clears throat> let's, let's go ahead. Cause this book will generate some feelings. Uh, mm-hmm. So overall, what are your feelings about this book? There is confusion. Hmm. I can start. Okay. So just like some general impressions and, and, and thoughts. So I really enjoyed this book. Mm. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say this. Okay, I, I, that wasn't even that wasn't even shade. I, I I genuinely did enjoy this book. I initially kind of getting into it, I was it, like it, it felt a little slow, but then like mm-hmm. I would say around the point where um yeah Joanna sent that letter to Maggie. Yeah, I feel like everything after 10. that yeah yeah after that yeah. I was like oh I am on for the ride because the <laughs> mess right. the mess that ensued and we can we can definitely talk more about that um so I feel like the the, the pacing was interesting I, I I loved a lot of just the like even if like some of the characters left some you know things to be desired I, I really enjoyed a lot of the themes of the book especially around the end I feel like there were a lot of conversations just about like black joy and how like love mm. and happiness and just kind of like choosing community is like really integral to like our own liberation but also kind of like finding like sort of like a sort of our um yeah, just like a sense of like sort of security and like kind of stability within just like this like racist fuckery that is the u.s mm-hmm. um obviously you know the book is extremely extremely well written like jesse redmond fawcett wrote to yep. this book this is her debut oh my mm-hmm. god what like mm-hmm. i just i like just the right, I, I would literally just like highlight certain lines. I'm like, yeah, that's just like for later. I mean, I'm just gonna like go back and just like read these quotes because like truly wrote the fuck out of this book. I loved a lot of the themes. I felt that it was. <sighs> we can we can get into this, but I you know I feel like the the ending was probably my least favorite part of the book. Mm-hmm. If I'm being honest, um, mm-hmm. just with kind of a lot of the characters like resolutions, um. I know I felt like a lot of the characters, yeah. particularly the black woman in the book, were like kind of on these arcs and these trajectories that I was like really here for. And like obviously like live your life. Like I'm just like a random bitch on a mic podcast again. Like, you know I mean? like like live your life. But it's also like I don't know, just it, it it was kind of disheartening to see 
how, especially for Joanna, you know, when she, oh, I guess spoiler, um, when she like <laughs> ends up with, P- when she like ends up with Peter, um, it, yeah, it's like her, her world kind of became about him and like, you know, she yeah. kind of just had mm-hmm. to like, you know, abandon a lot of her own ambitions and talents mm-hmm. and stuff like that. It just, you know, I was like, this is not, I don't love this. Love um, this. yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I have other thoughts, but those are just, yeah, some initial, initial sprinklings for the conversation. Yeah. What did y'all think? Um, the second you said that, I thought of sprinkles on cupcakes. <laughs> That's the image in my mind. I was like, <laughs> I would just sprinkle hey. on the conversation. <laughs> um, I agree with, I pretty much agree with, with most of your points. Like, um, I really was impressed by the writing and I was like, geez, we really, gee whiz. I feel went back to the 1940s, <laughs> but, um, we, <laughs> we really like, just do not give enough credence to the the Harlem Renaissance. Like yeah, we just don't, because we did the Black of the Berry on our show as well, mm-hmm. and Mule Bone, which we only read two out of the three acts. Whoops, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but these books are so well written. They are so beautifully done, and I can see you know what you're saying about her being an editor. Like she must have gone through so many and must have helped with you know the writing style and the synchronicity of so many mm. works but i'm just like this really truly was a renaissance and we do not give it i mean what did they just say hurston and hughes and then the day is over mm-hmm. right so i was like this is brilliant i do wish that the character some of the characters had more like who was it vera who was like going down mm, to the south and yeah. passing and doing all this stuff I was like wait we need a whole another book on <laughs> is this a series well <laughs> as you What's say vera that she to? actually has a book that does deal with passing. Really? Oh, okay. Yeah, one okay. of her, is it one about of her books. Specific- uh, I can't remember mm-hmm. which one, but it, I think it its main theme is people passing. Oh, interesting. Because mm-hmm. and you can see what I love about this book is you can see that she knows the time she's living in, and not just knows it, but understands the nuance of it, of the socio politics of the day, the class differences. Mm-hmm. You know how that interacts with racism. Um, it really, for me, felt so resonant to now that it was painful. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like not as not as blatant, but still pretty blatant, right? Because they're in New York, so they they don't live in Jim Crow South, and you would hope it would be more different than than like the ninety early twentieth centuries, even in like northern states. But it's really not, you know. Yeah. Um, and so there were so many things that resonated there, and I loved the like we don't care about capitalism at the end when yeah. peter gives up like he's like my kid does not need your money or your name or your recognition and i was like i love this rejection of oppression and capitalism and whiteness for community and love mm-hmm. and then i was like why you're none of the black women <laughs> <laughs> right. given a full story <laughs> yeah. i am confused there is confusion in Akko. <laughs> <laughs> Period. Um, so, yeah, and I, I tried not to judge too hard because I was like, well, people want love. Like, you can't uh-huh. say that that's not what might be someone's ambition. Like, for Maggie, maybe that's what she wanted. For that Joanne, that doesn't sound like what Joanne no, wanted. So, like, yeah. That just can't yeah, be Yeah, she kind of switched up because before it was right. like, mm-mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's hard to believe, you know, that that's not just an, you know, and it's, it, then you start to get this idea of like, res- for a book that kind of was dismantling respectability, it kind of at the end switches. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Specifically for a woman oh and respectability. So you're just kind of like, that's odd, an odd <laughs> choice, but I don't know. But I, again, love the book. I, I really liked it. I have so many thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I enjoyed it too. And like, like you, it, it was kind of moving along. First, it was kind of like you're hearing this history timeline. You're hearing mm-hmm. these people and you're hearing about their history. And then all of a sudden, it, there's this point in the story where um, Joanna finds out that uh, her brother might be catching a flame for Maggie, who grew up with mm-hmm. them mm-hmm. and was a part of the group, but wasn't a part of the group. You know, so you had this right. class thing and. Even though they're all black and they can't go where they want to go in the world, but mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, and then she decides, like you said, it, it, it was like, wait a minute, she is not going to like. Mm, well, let me write a letter. 
And I was like, mm-hmm. no. <laughs> yeah. And then from then yeah. on, it just, the pace makes you, you can't put it down. You I, I'll yeah. just read one yeah. more chapter and I'm going to put this yep. down and, you know, yeah. you're five more chapters in. So it makes you turn the page. Um, just to put some context on this, this book was written, There is Confusion was written and published rather in 1924. So mm. almost 100 years mm. ago. Uh, wow. And just so we wow. can understand that the Civil War wow. ended in May of 1865. Mm-hmm. And the first world war went from 1914 to 1918. And that's like the last big event in this book. So it's talking about people mm-hmm. who were born in the late 1800s. They were like one good generation out of slavery. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, they, and man, in matter of fact, there's a line that they're the first generation not directly touched by slavery. In other words, Mm-hmm. their grandparents may have been slaves or their parents may have been children as or just got out of slavery, but they mm-hmm. knew nothing of it. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And, and uh, like the NAACP started in 1909. Mm-hmm. So when Jesse, um, Fawcett wrote this, she was telling the history or direct history of her, you know, what she knew. Yeah. And right. you get, you learn a lot. And that's what I like too. It gives you a real different view of yeah. what middle class, what I guess the closest thing to middle class life was uh, at that time for black people in the Northern city. So yeah, it, it, I love the book there. I had some feelings. I had some feelings about why are you replicating the thing that, Talk keep about you it. out come on I mean, mm, yeah. come on how we don't have in the class yeah. system come on black folks but it is true people do that i think that's a human thing and um i i look at that and i think about them coming of age and i think about my generation coming of age in the late 70s 80s as being one of the first generations that had all their civil rights as mm. at 18 19 20 year olds Compared to my dad, who didn't have all the civil rights, mm. um, you know, it, it was pretty much illegal to do all the stuff people did could do to black people <laughs> during that yeah. time. So it, yeah. it, uh, I can I can see some parallels in terms of the excitement of what the world offers, but then you also run up against one. You run right. up against nasty people who are just nasty, and then you run up against the fact. No, there's still our limits and there's still our walls and barriers. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, since we (laughs) talked about that, um, which character did you like the best and which character did you want to jump through the pages (laughs) and fist fight them? (laughs) Let's see. We'll start Hmm. with the nice thing. Which one did you like the best? And that might be kind of tricky. So this is like a combat. The Maggie Joanna dynamic, like I was really bad at Joanna <laughs> when yeah. she wrote that letter. I was furious, and it reminds me of I don't know if you guys have ever seen Atonement, starring Keira Knightley, and I think the director is Joe Wright. Uh-huh. Um, I feel like I but, might have seen this like once I'm upon a time. Have to look for that one. <laughs> well, when I was a teen, I watched it as a teenager, and it it like I was crushed by it because. In it, um, a young girl who I now I think she was a little woman or something. She's European, but she her older sister is in love with someone. It's James. Her older sister is Kira Knightley, and she's in love with James McAvoy, who is a lower class than them. And she's she also has a crush on James McAvoy. He's like a family friend. And so, okay, trigger warning. I'm about to talk about um sexual violence. But there is a point when someone is accused of sexually assaulting one of her other female friends her age. Mm -hmm. And she knows who the right person is. She actually knows who it was. But she says James McAvoy because she saw her, him and her sister making out Mm -hmm. and got, I guess, jealous. Oh, my God. And this letter, and she was like 10, 11 at the time. 
Mm-hmm. And this letter <laughs> it basically forces James McAvoy to go to war. Um, they like send him off and he's forced to fight, I think in World War One actually. And it's this, the thing about it, and okay, spoiler alert for the movie, there's a point in the movie where she grows up and she sees her sister and James McAvoy again and they're together and they yell at her and they're like, how could you do this? Like she confesses about the letter and they yell at her and they get really mad and she's ashamed. But then actually <laughs> the movie does a twist and you find out that her sister died as a nurse, never seen James McAvoy again. What? And James McAvoy died on the front lines, never seeing his sister again. And she wrote Atonement, a story where they get together mm. <laughs> and they yell at her as a way to like um, atone <laughs> oh my God. For, mm. for, for this, right? And I, when I was reading Joanne's letter, I was like, Oh, Stone Man. <laughs> like, I was like, mm. you are about to set this whole thing off. And it does. It does set yeah. it off. Uh, like this story's happier than Atonement. Um but but yeah, it I was so upset with Joanne because I was Joanna, because I was like, You are trying to reach for your dreams. You understand that you're you should be able to reach for yours. But Maggie shouldn't. <laughs> like right. why should she be limited? And and the flippantness. I think that what got me was how flippantly she did it and mm-hmm. didn't really think about it again. Like at all, right. And I was like, oh, I am in fury. And I, it made me so angry watching her trying. I like wanted her to succeed, I guess. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I was really rooting for Ma- Ma- uh, Maggie. Yeah, I was like, okay, when is this girl going to get? And when she almost died, when they, when yeah. they made it like she was going to die, oh I was like, God. I'm throwing this book in yeah, the trash. I'm like, so upset. <laughs> <laughs> luckily she does not die so yeah. but but it would have been realistic if she had too right like that uh-huh. would have but i was so upset so that was that was my debacle mm. Mm. no that's real so for me this is interesting so my favorite character i guess i could say there are maybe two um so very much agree with everything aqua said as far as maggie's concerned i was very much rooting for her the whole time. Also, so there's a bit where, so Maggie, just for context, you know, she was in love with Philip, and then Joanna kind of like fucked that up with this letter that was like, oh, like Maggie ain't shit, girl. Like, actually, no, sorry, my bad. She wrote Maggie the letter and was like, mm-hmm. you're like poor, um, and you could never, you <laughs> literally, <laughs> you literally, it's like you literally could never be with Philip because, girl, the embarrassment. So Maggie like fell into despair. She ended up like getting together with this guy named Henderson Neal, who was extremely toxic and awful they ended up separating um she ends up kind of getting with peter at one point and then they kind of split up because and that that's that's who i'm about to mm. Mm -hmm. um but then that kind of like crumbles or whatever because basically peter only really wanted to get with maggie because he was like hurt that joanna didn't want him anymore and so maggie kind of goes this is really beautiful like self-reliance arc um where she like Mm -hmm. she like she's always been like a really great entrepreneur like she uh, like she worked in like the hair and beauty industry and like she ended up actually going to france um as part of the war to like kind of help support peter was there at the same time um and she was just like you know i'm not like here for y'all like i'm here to just like yeah you know do a service and like really just like be in a different space and like you know when i get back to the u.s i'm gonna like start my like hair companies again and i'm really about to just like just like make a name for myself and just like really be out here and like just like really Mm -hmm. rely on myself and like the the quote that describes that um is actually probably my favorite from the book i'm not sure if there will be a quote section later but like i i that it it really i like highlighted it and was like this like low-key brings tears to my eyes like i just love this imagery um Oh, say the quote. Okay. So this is basically describing um, Maggie's feelings once she's like in France. She actually had a conversation with Peter and was like, girl, like I'm done with your ass. And he was like, oh my God, that's wild. Um, And she's like deciding that, you know what? I'm just going to like love me relentlessly henceforth. So this is how the quote reads. Her newfound independence was a source of the greatest joy. Each night she mapped out afresh her future life. When she returned to America, she would start her hair work again. She would inaugurate a chain of beauty shops first class ones of her ability to make a good living she had no doubt and she would gather about her friends simple kindly people whom she liked for themselves who would seek her company with no thought of patronage she would stand on her own two feet maggie ellersley serene independent self-reliant the idea exalted her and she went about her work the picture of optimism and happiness and i was just like I just love this book. I just love this image. I love this idea of being so in love with yourself that like 
yeah. the rest of your day just is, it just truly becomes the picture of like happiness incarnate like i just love that so much so yeah so very much maggie i really fuck with her whole arc um as far as my other positive person i would say so kind of a minor character but um i really liked joelle's dad or sorry joanna's dad um joelle yeah um mm-hmm. He was just, like, very supportive of Joanna from, like, a very young age and, like, was always mm-hmm. like, yeah, girl, like, anything you dream of, like, we're about to make it happen. Like, I will literally do whatever it takes, like, because in his own life, he reached a level of success, but not necessarily in doing work that he really wanted to do. And so, like, seeing, that, like, the ambition in Joanna, he was like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to just, I'm going to, yeah, just, like, try to make it happen for her as much as I can. So I just, yeah, I just found him very, like, altruistic and, like, super positive. Um as far as my sorry, are we are we doing negative people now? Or yeah, we, gonna, we, we go, can jump on it. Yeah. Bet. Okay, so Peter, bye. <laughs> I have some words <laughs> for you, Miss Girl. So Peter, bye again. Context is basically like Joanna's bow throughout throughout the book. Um, yeah. and then Joanna essentially left him because she was like, "You have no ambition, and it's embarrassing." Um, and he was like, "Oh my god, this is devastating." And so he like gets together with Maggie, and then was like we should get married because being with you is like easy in a way that it wasn't with Joanna. But also I'm not really in love with you. I just kind of want to like, this is high key a rebound. Uh, I don't know if that terminology yeah. was a thing in like 1924, <laughs> but um, yeah, that was very much the situation. And the, my issue with Peter is a number of things. One. I mean, that alone was an issue. Right. Mm-hmm. When he was with Maggie and he was like, you know what? I should really leave Maggie because I'm like not really in love with her. Like they had gotten engaged. And he's like, yeah, I don't really want to get married. Like this is weird. He like it like the way he would describe the situation. He made it seem like it was somehow Maggie's fault or like uh-huh. Maggie was doing too much <laughs> for like wanting to get married. Like he was like, let's get married. And she was like, yeah. And he was like, yeah. I just really feel like Maggie's doing a lot. I'm like, honey, <laughs> like you propose how? Like, huh? like, so just like the gaslighting, I just couldn't. I was like, girl, what the fuck. Also, at the end, when, like, Peter ends up getting back together with Joanna, like, I don't know, he was just like, yeah, you know, Jana, like, it just all your singing career, your dancing, just your artistic flair, mm-hmm. you know, all that's just going to have to end, you know, because yeah. I'm, a, I'm a man. Raise those and kids, you, you know? just, you, know, you got to raise these kids. Like, there's just, there's just truly no room. Like, I just right. must take For up both. all the space. Um, so your life's about me now. Like, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, you know, just it's just how it has to be. And I'm mm-hmm. like, I don't. How that's that not how that's not actually be. how this has to be and also i just felt like peter's arc was inconsistent and you know what maybe mm. i'm jumping ahead but i'm gonna just say it here's what i'm gonna say so peter comes from a line of people who have varying relationships with like whiteness um i think peter's grandfather isaiah i think his name was was kind of more i think sympathetic to white people no I'm, i might be mixing it up there he had well, a grandfather that he's their son Right. So basically, so I for, I'm forgetting names, but one of uh-huh. Peter's, either his dad or his grandfather, like, was kind of like more sympathetic to white people and another one wasn't like was very much like anti like white people was like, I fucking hate white people. And so Peter sort of like jumped between these sort of like different mentalities like throughout his life. And when, when he like went to France, like to go to war, he ended up meeting um like Meriwether by who essentially sort of like his white counterpart within his same family. They had this whole thing where there were like the black buys and the white buys, but the gag is like, there's actually not, that actually doesn't exist. They're actually the same <laughs> lineage of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but like when he was getting to know Meriwether who was around his age and all of that, like he kind of was like, Oh, like maybe white people like aren't that terrible. Cause Meriwether's not that bad, like blah, blah, blah. Um, and then at the end he realizes that like, Oh, like his great grand, like his great, grandfather like his grandfather one of those on like the white side um which is like kind of a coward throughout most of his life and like knew that that wasn't really a racial division that truly existed but like you know kind of kept it up or whatever and so peter was like yeah you know like i realized that like the whiteness within me like that was the part that was like indecisive my entire life that was the cowardice that showed up mm-hmm. and i'm like yeah i think that was you, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he was like and he was right. like it might and have he just was, been you peter right and he was like <laughs> oh you know like i'm all about like blackness i'm about to we're about to liberate ourselves like whatever whatever but then i'm like yeah but you also just named your son meriwether by like after mm-hmm. this like white lineage um interesting choice there also your entire arc pretty much in like act three is basically like oh like white Meriwether by dies during the civil war um this is the one that was like around peter's age also yeah oh, sorry y'all there's... world war one sorry Wait, it's world war yeah one, world war one oh mm-hmm. sorry did i say that my bad um 
but yeah, so like died during the um during World War One, and basically he's like, yeah, like I just want to be the man that like Meriwether by would like want me to be. Like I just need to like be the part. Like I need to kind of actualize like sort of his vision of everything. And I was just like, it's a lot of um, yeah, a lot of uh, just you really mm. kind of caping for whiteness here, which is fine, I guess. But like I don't know, it just seemed like oh, like Peter's free and liberated, but also like his whole like his motivation at this point is pretty much just to like kind of be the person that Meriwether would have wanted him to be as opposed to being the person that he would want himself to be like I don't know it just seemed very like I just you know what Peter I don't I don't love this but so Marcy I I agree with what you're saying in part Mm -hmm. mostly that Peter was very annoying (laughs) sexist (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you know how I, f- I I have a strong thing that I've mentioned. I really, really do not love it when people um, are in love with someone else and then something happens there. And so they like rebound onto someone else. Right. Uh-huh. I, it, it's it like grinds my gears. I guess now we're in the 1980s, but like it just it irritates me <laughs> so much. Um, so I was like the second I read that, I was like, really, Peter? And then like, he, yeah, exactly. He was like, what did he say? He was like. I hope you don't think I'm a bad guy, <laughs> Maggie. But yeah. I don't want to marry you, and I've been streaming you long. <laughs> it's not that I'm a bad guy, Maggie. You're like, no, Peter. No, that is what that, that is it's okay. Exactly what's happening. What that means, <laughs> right? But I do think that there's a nuance here in the war, in the sense that I think it's it's not it's I I feel like at this point Peter and Meriwether become metaphors, or maybe mm. I'm no, I'm I'm gonna say I'm gonna give Jesse that 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 credit. Mm. Uh, they become a metaphor for. Um, a racial like transcendence that we only see in popular literature after MLK um, mm. and this idea is people as people first uh-huh. um, mm. and so that Meriwether and and Peter in this war in a different country outside of the American context she's saying here in this moment they're allowed to be humans they're allowed to be what they are which is cousins mm. who love each other because it's not weird to name your kid after your cousin mm. it's not weird to name them after a cousin who died in your arms uh, mm. you know the lens that that distorts this is is racism you know the the lens the confusion right mm. that's thrown into this is, is racism is the institutional issue that that lens comes right back when they come back right and the grandfather is like they're like, well, would you name, would you, you know, name Meriwether your heir? And he's like, um, um, well, <laughs> and <laughs> it's like, okay, do? well then, <laughs> right. What good would that do? You're like, well, gee, well, you, I don't know, <laughs> Mr. By, like who could say, <laughs> but I think, I think that's what Jesse was trying to get at mm. was before, you know, cause we take it for granted, right? Cause we, the MLK era has already happened for us, but this is 19, early 1920s, right? Slavery was like not even not half even a decade half ago a dec- yeah yeah and she's talking about something transcendent she's saying for at least america the american time that she lives in like yeah but we are people first and and outside of this we're we're, we're people and maybe she went to france too and she saw you know what i mean and mm. you see that with the way because i think that's where the american black americans sort of you know they talk about the the double victory and and that's world war ii but like um how black americans went abroad in the, these two time periods and that is what started like the that changed the trajectory like if we're talking about things that changed the trajectory mm-hmm. it changed the trajectory of of the black american you know um philosophical thought like yeah. hey other places we are not this like this is specifically here and therefore mm-hmm. is not a transcendental quality about us you know and so i i see threads of that in the story and so it does seem kind of odd but i think that's what she's getting at mm. um i think it's a little lost in the sauce i agree with you. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I did see yeah. it and yeah there's and there's a lot of sauce but mm. i think that's what i saw that i was like because especially when her the last line is about love because mm-hmm. right i think it gets mixed mixed up with the woman too it, like somehow all the women are like yeah we'll give up our careers for love yeah. and you're like how come all the women but but the the idea right of turning away from capitalism of choosing community and 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 love and happiness over basically right like instead of 
instead of what Joanne did, which at the beginning, which was reinforce the stereotypical social hierarchies, mm-hmm. right? Mm. In the end, the idea is to turn away from that, right? And, and focus on us. Now, maybe it's somewhere in there that she should have reconciled with Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe somewhere in there, like it should have explained, you know, that this was about the community and not just about Joanna giving up all her dreams and ambitions, which yeah. is what a lot of women have to do. But I, I guess that's what I was seeing mm. in there, you know? I don't know. No, that's, thank you for saying that. that like, I, I really appreciate that you said that because that is um, certainly a nuance that I didn't capture like obviously like i knew that like you know peter and meriwether were really close but it just yeah like at the end i was just kind of reading it and i was like i don't know it just it just seemed like i guess there were just a lot of lines as far as like oh you know i really want to you know sort of be the person meriwether will want me to be and i'm like i mean Mm -hmm. yes like i mean that's i mean that's fine i guess but also too like i mean you're not living your life for meriwether you know like i guess right. and also right. too it might be a form of you know grieving as well like it's like you know mm. you're you're trying to process all that happened and like meriwether died in this extremely traumatic way so perhaps like to embody some of like you know his values feels like a way of like maintaining memory or like kind of keeping some sort of like um at least philosophical sort of kindling of his life um Mm-hmm. a nuance that i'd never really thought about literally at all until i just said it to y'all um on the podcast <laughs> so there is so yeah so it's just it's just making me think and um yeah i think you're absolutely right and yeah huh I still think yeah. peter sucks for the other reasons mentioned <laughs> but yes there is more I, nuance there I agree as well with you fully i i yes i could what sum you, peter up as this if peter was alive now he would be riding a huffy bicycle because he didn't have his driver's license, wearing wearing slippers and black socks, looking for some woman to let him stay at their house. That's Peter. <laughs> he's that yeah. dude. He's just dude. Peter, but come on, cute. just be he you. Like. And he he used a lot of people, and he's like, oh, I'm gonna be great for Joanna. And him, well, him and Joanna had a certain uh, mixture. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't like, I mean, they played well. She needed someone to beat up on and pull, but he also needed that. And they, neither one of them was really my favorite. Uh, Come person. on. Like, uh, thank Peter, you. Peter, I, Peter I, yes. but yeah. when he did what he did to Maggie, I thought, okay, you need to yeah. be punched in the chest. Um, Cause it's cruel. Yeah. It's, it's cruel. It was. And, and to, to say someone like his line that like, I wouldn't have to do. And, I I know that y'all, you know, like I I don't want to come for every man who ever existed, but <laughs> <laughs> or even the majority, but there there is a common theme in sexism, right? Mm-hmm. Of tears of woman, of of the woman mm-hmm. that you get when you're successful and the woman that you get if you fall just below successful and the woman mm-hmm. that you know, there is a a, <laughs> right. a a a tearing of yourself against the woman you quote unquote are able to to have mm. fallen in love with you. And as a woman, <laughs> not to speak for all of the women's, but um, there is a fush, uh, to, and to be a dark skinned woman is to be on the other side of people's gaze and, mm-hmm. and to be, there's an existential irritation with other people's idea that you must be in a specific place so that they can climb a rung <laughs> to mm. a higher place. And then, and, and if, if you, if they should be so, you know, unlucky as to fall down the ladder, well, at least you're there to greet them with mm. cookies. Mm. I right. bet Maggie's cookies were delicious. And, and there's, I was infuriated by his behavior. So yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, but, even after he, Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say what Jesse paints is real. It wasn't like she just made mm-hmm. something up. This is mm-hmm. real. It is, I I was thinking about this story and how, you know, patriarchy and uh, white male supremacy runs so rampant and why the men couldn't be what they wanted to be because they could never be white men. They could never have that sort of power and just being. And Mm -hmm. so they attempted to replicate it. And um, Mm -hmm. so I pick a certain woman because as opposed to no. We're not a part of this, so why don't right. we build a new si- new thing for manhood, um, Ooh, which is hard. It. You know that that takes some thought and courage. 
and yeah. where you're going to be something else. It, it was a little disappointing that all the women kind of said, okay, well, now that you're all broke down and got these issues, we'll take care of you. I thought, hey, here goes black women <laughs> carrying the load again, you know? Yeah. It's like, no. Um, that that bothered me that those yeah. the especially peter but my favorite character mm -hmm. uh was vera and vera Interesting. Manning, who, who yeah talk about it was a friend and she was kind of a wasn't too much of a major character but then she keeps getting introduced and at one point she sees um joanna and she's like no well i'm passing now so i can't be everywhere with you because joanna had color she was a darker skinned girl and uh but vera first she just started passing and the way she talked about well no it's just free it's, it's mm -hmm. like it's it kind of sound the way she talked is the way i hear some youtube you see people who move to ghana or move to countries in africa and they said for the first time they just felt like a human being because everybody's mm -hmm. black so they weren't the black person and mm. for Vera, she was like, no, it's just free to just, okay, people take me as white and I move on. And then she didn't do that with the sense of, well, bye-bye, hmm, black people. I'm going to enjoy this <laughs> bye passing <blacks>. life. <laughs> she <laughs> Surfer's like, ooh, sorry for you. Yeah. Ooh. She's she, like, oh, no. It's like, I'm just going to take my <laughs> mug of white yeah. and just <laughs> be on my merry <laughs> way. Do, 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 do. You know, she, like, she took that and said, I'm going to go down to the south and use the fact that i can pass to mm -hmm. help document what's happening to black people and mm. that was the bravest thing any one of those yeah. folks did because she truly took her life in her hands yeah and it would have been so easy for her to just accept the privilege that being mm, right. extremely light-skinned meant for her and she could have just went and lived her life just hoping that someone didn't call her out. But instead, she went down to the South to document what people were doing. And yeah. she was just hoping that people don't find it because they would, like she said, Kill in certain her. states yeah. like in Georgia, where they lynch women, too. And this was yeah. the mm -hmm. time when the lynching campaign, the anti-lynching campaign was at its height uh, the, because... Yeah. Black soldiers were coming back from World War One and getting lynched and murdered. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I like for wearing her. their uniform, like for wearing a. Well, just... I got a story. <laughs> this is okay. in the eighties, mm -hmm. about eighty eight. I was mm -hmm. uh, in Boston. I was an officer in the Navy, so I, I was uh, in Boston, and I'm walking around with my whites on, uh, the, the white uniform, <laughs> and. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm walking around, doo -doo 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 -doo. I thought, hey, this would be cool. I'll just, you know, be a black officer walking around. And um, mm -hmm. <laughs> most people were kind of cool with that. In Maine, people were really cool. They were like, can you get us on the ship? Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but in Boston, you know, it was Boston. And where the ship was docked was actually in South Boston. And mm -hmm. uh, so I, mostly I was just walking. Wait, we should still. explain for the ah, the kids who don't know about South Boston. <laughs> South Not Boston from has the a Coast. history. They had a major thing when they did desegregation. They, there's this famous event of them throwing rocks and mobbing a bus full of black children to prevent them mm -hmm. from coming on. Now, those people say, no, the bus tried to run over some people who were protesting, but, you know, they got children yep. in there and y'all are going off. Mm -hmm. mm. With rocks. Yes. So South Boston is interesting. But I was walking along and in uniform and um, first, the first thing is I was, these folks, this family, this guy, his wife and little kid, they were coming from the ship. So they went on a tour on a ship that I served on. And I'm walking down the street and I'm just walking straight ahead. And he's looking at me and you could tell when someone's looking at you, like, I just want to kill you. Mm -hmm. I don't know oh you. God. I didn't do anything to you. Yeah. I'm just walking. But I guess he felt I had no right to be in uniform, let alone an officer. And he was looking like he could kill. And then this little child started singing, grab a nigger by the toe. Oh my God. <laughs> and then he, uh, he said, stop it, Jimmy, or whatever the kid's name. 
I'm like, okay, let me just keep, because I'm an officer. I just can't go off, you know, mm-hmm. that's not going to look right. Let me just, I'm not, in, I'm not in Cleveland, <laughs> not in my hometown, right? Uh, mm-hmm. not on the east side. So nothing I could do. So let me just move on. And that's one family. And then there was another, I was going, walking around and uh, this, these two guys, they, granted they one they were intoxicated. It looked like they were settling down for the night with their bottle, but all of a sudden they started saying, Hey, Hey, you, he was, he's, he's calling you. And I said, I don't know. I, I am not paying attention. And he said, he said, nigger with his Boston accent. What and the then the fuck? other guy said, how dare you wear that uniform? And then I looked around and I realized, yeah, I am the only black person. I am wearing a white uniform. Now, I went and got on the subway and went to the black neighborhood and went to the jazz club, and I was good. <laughs> nobody bothered me. They were just like, man, look at you and your white on white on white, but nobody bugged me. <laughs> uh, and so I think about that. Now, I didn't have anything where no one physically assaulted me or anything like that. But the point was, it's a small. Okay, but it was still bad. Bit yeah. Like, just to know. These folks. It doesn't are, matter. Yeah. The, I'm in uniform. Yeah. I'm. I can't be any more respectable than that. Mm-hmm. I'm an officer in the Navy wearing uniform, walking gently down the street, being nice to people and talking to folks. I can't do more, any more than that. And yet people felt comfortable coming out there. That child was saying that song. He felt comfortable doing that. Yeah. And those guys who were saying what they, they felt comfortable doing that. And uh, um, I can imagine what the soldiers who came back from World War I went through, where they felt pride, they had fought, been shot, injured, hurt, gassed. Lost people. Lost people. Yeah. Had to carry the dead and do everything dirty. And then you come back and someone's going to rip your uniform off of you. Mm-hmm. People who didn't go and fight in the war are going to fight you. So, so I, that brings up some stuff. Well, one, that is awful. I'm like, I, I know this happened like very like a long time yeah, ago, but yeah. like that, that's extreme. That, that's horrible. Like that's awful. Like I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm so sorry that that happened. And like, I guess my question is, and sorry if I'm you know missing some historical context here, but I guess what is the ire behind? a black person wearing any form of like Navy or military, like, like w- uniform, like what, like what is the issue exactly? Like, it's like, uh, like wh- so, why are people mad about that? Like, yeah, it's a sense that, well, my thought is one, I was wearing an officer's uniform and okay. you're black high, and you're not ranking. supposed to be that second mm-hmm. you're wearing a uniform. Um, that that says you're a part of the establishment and I don't like you. You can't be what I think you are if you get serve on our ship. Serve serve on the ship and, and serve in this me. country. Yeah. And it's the whole thing of and you run this with people in general. You think you're better than me. And it's so mm-hmm. important for certain people to have a group they're better than. And mm-hmm. the same thing happened in this story where white people have always said, Well, at least I'm not black. <laughs> They've always had mm-hmm. that. But the same thing with the folks in this story, they had a sense that they were better than the common black folks. Right. Mm-hmm. Even though you had to get on segregated cars if you went down south just like me. Right. right. But that's something in people. Uh, and it's weird. I read an article in the Wall Street Journal. So just a quick tangent. In Japan, it's 99 99- Point nine percent Japanese. Okay, it's Japanese people everywhere. They have. A, it was one guy who was a prime minister who was from some group, some uh, family or group, and they said it was monumental that he was there because normally this group is looked down upon and they can't hold high office, mm-hmm. and it's because their ancestors used to be people who tended graves, and they said that the challenge was. How do you keep track when everyone is Japanese? So it's not like these are just black Japanese people, you know, nothing physical. 
They're all Japanese, mm. and they do it by keeping detailed records of birth and who your lineage was. And that's how people determine who they could discriminate against. And I was like, oh my God. So even if you are in a country that's almost entirely homogeneous, people just find something to say, I'm better than this group. But here's what I will say. Aka's about to do like a quick footnote. And again, if anyone knows, I'm, I could be wrong, but <laughs> we have to remember that like there's a history of Japanese imperialism, internal and ex- external. And it, a lot of that too was imported from the Western, um, like the early 20th, I guess late 19th century imperialism with the opening up. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was this fear at the time of being colonized by the West because actually the Chinese coast was being colonized. Um, and Japan was like, uh, that can be us. And so there was like, okay, we need to modernize. And But they chose like Germany and Britain as their models. I'm not saying, you know, that the Japanese are, are unable to discriminate <laughs> without the help of colonialism, mm-hmm. but the specific type of colonialism. And, and in fact, their imperialism spread in a way that was very similar to British and German and Western colonialism. Um, there was actually, so they... Um, like Korea became like a colony. And so then Korean Japanese were actually discriminated against for a long time. It's like a really crazy story. There was like a, I think in the early 20th century, there was like an earthquake and they were like, somehow it was the Korean Japanese fault. Like how that was possible, who knows? And actually that discrimination lasted for a a very long time Uh up into the present. And there is an interesting idea like of Japan as homogeneous, but actually like, the, during like their the formation of the of it as an empire, like there were different islands with different like groups of people and different languages. So mm-hmm. it's you, the, you have to be when people say countries are homogeneous. China also there's like a talk of homogeneous homogene homogeneity, mm-hmm. but it's 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 usually pretty false. Mm-hmm. Okay, <laughs> there usually is some underlying things there, um, histories of like imperialism or something you know different. Groups. I'm not going to say I know all that much about J- Japanese history, yeah. so I don't want to like overstate. Mm-hmm. But I sometimes, I guess my point to this is I sometimes wonder about things we call innate. And I wonder if instead, rather, they're just innate to a specific social structure that is just globally prevalent mm-hmm. right now. Okay. Or mm-hmm. has been for the last 200 years, you know. Um Anyway, that's a side tangent, but (laughs) it makes, yeah, I don't know. It just makes me think, um, bringing it back to there is confusion, that same idea. I I think a lot of Americans get away with this idea of, well, humans just discriminate. Humans just do in groups and out groups. But, and you're like, well, yeah, humans make choices and we we shorthand our choices Mm -hmm. to make decision making faster. But does that particularly lead to intense and nuanced systems of institutional I know. racism, sexism? <laughs> and, We're suddenly and near separate water sexism? fountains. And, uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> Was, is that not like an excessively, you know, far example to say that that's human nature? I think so. You know, that's, that's the part that gets me, I think. Um, yeah. But actually, Marcy, to your earlier question, and it comes up in this book too, about why they're so angry about um, a black person in a suit, right? And it, and it is to Curtis's point, the whole American compromise <laughs> is, right, is that you will be better than a black person. Mm-hmm. That is the whole American compromise. In the constitution, you have one person and you have three fifths person. Therefore, mm-hmm. just by definition, there should be someone who you are a quote unquote more of a person than. Yeah. Right. And so in this period, in this 20th century, with the end of slavery, you're seeing this upheaval. Uh, you know, I, the line there is confusion is so brilliant because there is so much confusion, right? There's so much upheaval um, because the whole thing is confusing. The constitution is confusion. Mm-hmm. The whole process uh-huh. is confusion. And the upheaval of this contradictory system, you know, and, and so that resentment, I think that you see, and, and that lasts until the present, because I've seen those eyes. 
um, mm. in my life. I'm not old. <laughs> I've seen those. I, when, when Curtis, you said like that look that someone looks like they could kill you. I was like, I flashed and I was like, I know exactly that look mm. that you're talking about. And it is this deep seated resentment that America has become something has, has reneged on its promise that I would always be better than a specific group of people. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. I agree. And that's where you, that's where you see like why can Joanna not be where where get, be the best even though she's the most skilled because you would have to then admit that the system is flawed and you'd have to admit that it is very possible that she is just better right. <laughs> at dancing. But it was more comfortable mm-hmm. for the folks to say, "Oh no, we we couldn't have you do that." Mm-hmm. And just exactly. point blank say it to her face. No. Mm-hmm. Are you crazy? No, we can't have you in class. You you need to start separate classes with your folks. We can't have right. you in the same class with, and to feel comfortable with saying that. Yeah, right. Um, it we we've come a long way, and that sometimes people now maybe we've got gener- generations of people who kind of like oh, I don't feel comfortable saying that, but you know. <laughs> but right. the fact is, at this time, even in the north, um where everyone thought, well, it's not as bad as it is in the South. It, it just was a different form. Mm-hmm. Exactly. But you quickly bumped up against it. Right. If you tried to do something. Yeah. Mm. And it's just, and, it's, it, and <laughs> my feelings about Joanna aside, um, you know, it is heartbreaking seeing her come to that realization where it's like, you know, kind of growing up she had this like pretty protective environment like really supportive family structure like just kind of this constant like and and also just like the resources to you know act on her passions and then get to a point where she's like but i'm 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 the best at this why is this not leading to success Mm -hmm. and it's like yeah joanna there's no you cannot rationalize people's prejudice right. and discrimination like it just it simply is and even even if it's like everyone would mutually benefit if like you were part of like this performance or this you know dance group or whatever the case may be like there's a there's this like 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 Akko mentioned this sort of like underlying sort of american promise of like oh well like you know if you like if we if we allow her in one that might mean that like other people like her are going to join which oh, can't have that or we might have to accept that, like, even Joanna, like, even though Joanna had pretty much all the cards stacked against her, she still mm-hmm. is better than all of you, which is simply just, I mean, how do you look at yourself, you know? So <laughs> I feel like it's just, yeah, it's, oh, God. It's just, yeah. like, wild. And I, I feel like we literally always say this about, like, any sort of Harlem Renaissance anything. But just, like, reading these books, I'm just like, so this was written yesterday? Okay, so this was written right. last week. Like, what the <laughs> fuck? Like, how is it still <laughs> track a hundred years later? Like, I just, oh, God. Um, but you know what was crazy? When I, well, it wasn't, it wasn't wild or anything like that. But when I was reading this, it made me, I could see the through line to the whiz. Um, and, okay. Yeah. So Well, so... Because there was, in The Wiz, we, when we talked about it on our show, there is, like, it is clearly, like, creepy underneath. <laughs> like, it is clear that oppression mm. is happening. And there's just this rebellious, like, unapologetic, like, um, conscious, conscious, that's what it is, conscious joy. Um, and it's actualized in this movie um and you see the threads of it here this this almost that i wasn't expecting this line that like yeah. my philosophy or like the most significant thing to me will be my happiness um and you see like a lot of activists now talking about black joy and happiness as revolutionary and 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 that it's not our our lives to suffer and you're you just see this through line this this through line that that completely turns its back on white oppression you know it mm. <laughs> i i love it so <laughs> much and and there's a line vera says and you know curtis that's why i c- completely understand why you like her so much she was just like i don't want to be white <laughs> like, she's yeah. like yeah i just don't she's like what the heinous things that they say like what you have to do to 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 need to hate another person to the point that you would murder them she was like it's heinous you know the things and she was like and then the second i showed up with the black people and i was like hey i'm black they like she was like they all helped me (laughs) like it was fine 
And it's Curtis, you say the same thing. You're like, that I just went on a bus and went to the Black Friday Town and hung out in a jazz club mm. and it was fine, you know? And and I think that's what I what I really like about this book is is that you see like the the beginnings or the shell or the, the seed of like not not continuing the structures of of the oppressor Uh um Mm. again i don't know why we couldn't get it with the woman (laughs) all the way through (laughs) because patriarchy is the last tower (laughs) to fall yeah oh that's okay we'll we'll let you folks of color have some okay you can have some freedom you got now wait a minute now you're gonna tell me me as a male i can't because because everyone wants Everyone wants the power that white men have had. And so I've right. seen black men who replicate it yep. in community mm, and they're yep. worse. They're like, mm-hmm. nah, I'm going to do it even better. And like, no, you, yep. we no. can do something else. <laughs> and like, no, right. they'll trade in a wife. They'll, you know, they have their, if I have this much money, then I get this kind of wife. And he's like, dude, that's mm-hmm. just wrong. You wouldn't be here. Right. You know, you <laughs> truly yeah. truly just the white people of black people um <laughs> yes. and it's just it's it's so interesting because um oh my god i was gonna say something about vera i was gonna say something about, oh so yes all of that to vera and also i'm, I'm I, I i forget the line exactly but i think she dead ass was like yeah girl white people aren't happy like like, yeah. like in the mm. aggregate white people just are not like there's just like a joy that's just like very specific to us and yeah. so like that i think also too kind of elicits this anger of like how the fuck are y'all happy right now like literally like we've tried to make everything as like mm-hmm. difficult as possible and yet y'all are here just living your lives being magic literally just experiencing love and laughter and that's just mm, it's just yeah I, I i loved that 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 this just this text existed like a hundred years ago of vera mm-hmm. being like yeah right. girl I, yeah girl i cracked the code like white people in the act like racism doesn't make them happy girl like honest everyone's miserable and i'm like huh Interesting, 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 interesting. Okay, good. And she says good another line. What does she say? She says, like, if we're just left to our own, we'll find joy. Yeah. Um, I just, I love that. That is, I literally read that and I was like, this has been the black phil- philosophy since, like, the, the maybe from the beginning. <laughs> right. Honestly, maybe from the beginning. But I was like, this is the antidote to oppression. And I think, mm. I think that's true. I think if we're taking anything that can be aggregated against across the, the humans, it is that exact thing. Mm. It is that you never replicate the oppression. You turn away completely. Mm. And I was like, Ugh, sometimes I just really just want to like be like, yo, we have the antidote for oppression in America. <laughs> it's black American. <laughs> I like want to like throw Harlem Renaissance books and like civil Breathe rights this. literature at people. <laughs> and like Alec them. Baldwin. <laughs> like, uh, sorry, not Alec Baldwin, James Baldwin. Oh my God. Um, we were going to go, like, go with it. You... <laughs> Thanks. Oh my God. But, but yeah. Also, I will say this. Um, I there was another point I wanted to say, and I I just remembered it. So yes to everything at, that we said earlier about just like kind of you know the black women's arcs at the end, and just how you know there's just like still so many like just so much like patriarchal like fuckery taking place. I will say though, after listening to the podcast episode, um, I want to give it a proper shout out. What what was the show called, Curtis? It was an, a podcast basically put out by MSNBC, Harlem on My Mind. Jesse Redmond Fawcett, Ooh, is that one? Yes. Into America yes. podcast? Yes. And I'll have the link in the show notes. Perfect. Yeah. So after listening to, you know, the the episode about Jesse Redmond Fawcett on uh into the on the Into America podcast, like it was interesting because um Dr. Julia Charles was talking about how, you know, just throughout Jesse's life herself, like a lot of her own opportunities were limited because she was a black woman and how like Mm. even in the literary space like the space that invites so much like imagination and imagination towards like what is our like what can our lives look like as black people like it's like the men still took up so much space such that like she wasn't really given the same platforms um and how a lot of her books i'm not sure yeah like a lot of her books just kind of explore this idea of like what is the limit of by which like a black woman can imagine like what Mm. like where is the cap there within this like system of unchallenged patriarchy and so part of me is like kind of like after hearing that I'm, I'm sort of looking at the ending again and i'm like maybe this is maybe. intentional maybe she did this yeah. on purpose just to kind of showcase like 
even after all of this, like, you know, these are kind of the limits of like, you know, where where black women can go mm. in sort of like an, in an aggregate sense. And I'm like, if that was the case, that's, I mean, pretty I know brilliant. for me, it, it's pretty brilliant and, and, and emotionally resonant such that like when I was reading the ending, I was like, what the fuck? Like, I was genuinely just like, what? Like, I, like, I don't, okay. I just, you know, it just, I felt bereft of like, it, like, it, I felt like, what is, what am I supposed to do with this? Like, this is not, this is not how this should be ending. Why is this the ending of this book? Um, mm. So I'm going to optimistically say that she wrote it like that way on purpose, just to kind of sh- like to make a point about um, just sort of dynamics that she had witnessed in her own life, but also just like, you know, for black women right. in the U.S. in general. Um, mm-hmm. so. Or even or even to write, be able to get it published. Like, mm. okay, like the middle will be exactly what I'm trying to write. And the ending is just to get it published. You know, mm. like. You had to have a happy ending. It had to have like a romance happily ever after the ending. Peter being rehabilitated and Lord knows why. <laughs> right, like why the fuck? Um, yeah, that's that's a I, good that's a good ass point. That's a good point. Because like maybe when you read it, you know, because so much of it is resonant until you get mm-hmm. to the end. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say too, like if we're giving shout outs to people who are forgotten, um, a line they sort of pass over, which is probably the the most significance is why the bi children are actually one family mm-hmm. which is trigger warning likely the sexual assault of a black woman yeah um who was enslaved and i think there is so much erasure of the sexual violence towards black women um during slavery and during the jim crow era mm-hmm. and i i remember reading that line and, and it's like a throwaway line he's like oh yeah i remembered her she was just like sitting at a chair wistfully oh there was a beautiful line where she's like maybe he she was looking into the future looking hard into the future to this point right now mm-hmm. um and i just i don't know my heart hurt like sank into my body because i was like i do not know the existential like crises i would be in to be in that situation and only have to imagine like the imagination of black women must be expansive and futuristic Mm -hmm. (laughs) because I don't know how anyone projected into the future that, you know, freedom. Um, God, I I was, I was like, God, there just needs to be so many more books about these women who Mm -hmm. will never know so much about. Um, yeah. Yeah. I agree. And capturing their stories. Uh real quickly, um how do you think those you have to tell someone and they said, Oh, that story is a hundred years old. Why would I want to read it? What would you tell somebody? <laughs> <laughs> Granted, we read much older stuff and we're forced to read it and we claim it's good, but okay. Period. <laughs> I would just, well, one, I would say because it's still deeply relevant. Like, it's like, yeah, it's 100 years old, but it's extremely relevant. Um, And also, too, it's just good. Like, it's it's good. It's good. interesting. And, like, you know, the characters, like, wow, oh, some of them are kind of rough. Like, mm-hmm. there is... There's a the writing and just the pacing and everything is just, it's just very, very engaging. And um, it's just important. Like, it's important that we highlight, you know jesse's work and like the, these legacies and these and like just the brilliance that she's like putting th- between these yeah. pages like yeah. there's just so much there's just so much wisdom that i'm like we like it, it just it's it's some um, yeah it's just it's simply important um and mm-hmm. also entertaining if that mm-hmm. if that matters but it, yeah yeah i was gonna say the characters are so human like you're, you're never yeah. reading it and being like that's unrealistic you know it's it's a very human slice of life it's and there's just I just love that I love literature, a black about black people that's just human. Um, there, and and whiteness is is a factor, but it's not the encompassing thing about their lives. Yes. It's not the exactly. focal point. Right. Um. Whereas a lot of literature now, whiteness is just somehow Center. the focal point. Yes. <laughs> like, right. Um. As, as opposed to just you know the lens is in the wrong place. Um. Mm. And so I love that about this story and. I, 
I think that in itself is is worth reading. But that's just yeah, it's just well written. Like man, if we got to read, uh, I don't know, the so Scarlet good. Letter. Oh right. Like, <laughs> I don't even hate the Scarlet Letter, but we got to read. <laughs> <laughs> That's the second time you've thrown it out there. <laughs> yeah, I should choose a different book. Um, but anyway, but yeah, I mean, it, we got to read Catch in the Rye 15 times. We yeah. can read There is Confusion. Like or something by Hemingway where you're like, oh, gosh. Right. Right. Yeah. Ooh, you you are dry, dude. <laughs> yeah. so it's just the and literary Hemingway, classics. And I'm like, also, Hemingway okay, acts like he's girl. like from the early 20th century that he's from like the mid 20th century to like yeah. Hemingway there's no reason for you to write this way like there's zero reason <laughs> like I feel like there are televisions by this point you're just being silly like anyway sorry <laughs> so and by having these conversations you know I think you know we 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 try and we we say we want schools to do certain things but I really believe going back to my experience with Bob Law and what he was doing sharing and encouraging people to go out and find these interesting things to read. And now we're able to do that and we're able to skip around. We don't have to wait for someone to say, mm -hmm. okay, we'll put one book. We'll put Hurston's their eyes are watching God on the curriculum. We don't have to wait around. I mean, we, you have to learn what you have to yeah. learn in school. You got to do what you got to do, but we have, such available access to all these great books. Here's a book that was published a hundred years ago, almost a hundred years ago, and you can just go get it. You can get it electronically. You can yep. just order yep. a copy of the book. You could just go to ifoundthisgreatbook.com slash Jesse. Oh, come on. Yes. <laughs> yes. J -E -S 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 -I -E, and J-E-S-S-I-E. And you I go right to, to that link and you will see links to every conversation I'm going to have with all the great folks and definitely going to have links to this conversation and the book you can click a link and you can purchase this book because i because we didn't get 10 percent of all the stuff that there. there's so much other stuff we didn't spoil mm. you could read this and you'd be like they didn't talk about that Ooh, that is like did they talk about anything <laughs> oh, yeah. what, what? they talked like an hour and a half they didn't talk about half the right. stuff i'm looking at but there's just so much in here and yeah. You will be, once you get past chapter 10, it's kind of like, you're like, okay, okay, what's going to happen? And then Joanna says, I will write a letter. And you're like, oh, Ugh. the messiness begins. And uh, it just, I'm so grateful to be alive and see this. And I'm, I'm mm -hmm. grateful that, you know, we're able to do uh, what couldn't be done when I was in my twenties and I was frustrated and uh, mm. anyone in the world can hear this. Anyone in the world can get hold of there is confusion by Jesse Redmond Fawcett and anyone in the world could listen to two of the most brilliant people talk about literature with a dash of shenanigans. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that is Marcy and Akko at the colored pages book club podcast so tell us real quickly what tell us about some of the cool things you guys are doing hmm well you know we um we have some collabs mm -hmm. just a couple just a few or maybe it's the some maybe we're the chance the rapper of collabs Man, <laughs> yes, that. you have some good <laughs> <Maybe. collabs. laughs> um you know, we, I mentioned The Wiz, so I'll mention that one. We did an episode for our summer short series of The Wiz with Rain from Carefree Black Nerd. Um, and it was a really fun conversation. It was really, it was literally de delightful. I'd never seen the movie. Um, Marcy, I don't think you've seen it. Yeah, you've I have seen it. Either. I, I know. Yeah. I know. yeah. <laughs> Someone's about to take away our cars, but it's fine. But <laughs> we've seen it now. <laughs> you can't take them away now. Hey, when I grew up, that yeah. was the thing seeing the play i got to see the play oh yes the jealousy yeah i didn't get to see stephanie mills in the play but i got to see the play when it went on tour mm. me and my so mom that's, oh that's i love beautiful. that so yeah but go ahead you, you, the, you did the um so and i'm just say one more thing so marcy and akko are kind of like one time i was in a movie theater and and they had the you know they do the preview this, this is pre coronas and they do the previews, and they had this one movie, and they said, oh, okay, and Kevin Hart, he played the role. And I said, oh, cool, Kevin Hart got a role. 
Then they showed another preview. And is this a movie with Kevin Hart? I said, what are you going to do? <laughs> then they showed another preview. And there was Kevin Hart. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> and they showed another preview. And it was Kevin Hart. I said, what is it? He's in every freaking movie. And that's how it is. I'm listening to my podcast. I listen to my book podcast. And they said, oh, and today our special guests are Marcy and Akko. I said, hey, look at them. <laughs> <laughs> they are the Kevin Hart's of collabs. Every time you turn around, they are popping up, sharing their wisdom. So go ahead. I'm I'm done running my mouth. Go ahead. Tell us some more about what's happening. This, your summer shorts um, series. What's going on with that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh Marcy, you, you go. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So our summer shorts series. Yeah. So over the summer, we usually like to, yeah, just kind of like, you know, Take a little bit of a break. So throughout the year, we typically will read novels and kind of, you know, do episodes in two parts. Whereas over the summer, we'll usually read like short stories, plays, um, and just kind of like play around with a bunch of different types of media that we're also interested in. So it's really interesting because this summer, actually, um, we've actually been diving into nonfiction a little bit. We usually don't mm-hmm. do that. But um, we actually recently did um, an episode about Persepolis. Um, Sorry, we recently did an episode um, about a book called Persepolis by Marjane Satrapi, which kind of follows her life living in Iran and like as Iran was going through um, the Islamic Revolution and just kind of like her adventures both there, but also like living in Europe and kind of like, you know, just kind of her experience with her family. Um, we've also been dabbling. I don't know when this episode's coming out, but we've been dabbling a little bit into video games as well. So mm. we actually played a visual novel recently called Butterfly Soup um, mm-hmm. by Brianna Lay, which is a story. It's It's like... It's a video game, but it tells the story of these, like, four queer Asian-American girls in, like, 2008 okay. who were just, like, fucking hila- like, hilarious, very funny. lit, just, like, amazing. And funny enough, speaking of collabs, um, we actually had um, our friends Marvin and Rira from Books and Boba on our show to, to talk about it. So, th- not sure if this episode's out yet. Uh, it'll come out at the end of July. That's all right. This episode is up then or not? Yeah, but, um, this episode will be up next week. So okay, bet. Okay, yeah. so this is in the future. <laughs> We're, this is for the future. For the future. So that's coming down the pike. Um, what else are we doing? Um, are we start our summer short series by talking about a comics an erotica comics anthology, specifically oh, highlighting uh, trans masculine and non binary people. Just like a lot of very, mm-hmm. just like. We just do it a lot of shit, just all over the place. And, And, you know, we did a really cool deep dive into whiteness with Fuck Boys of Literature. The host is Emily. We did. And we read um, A Streetcar Named Desire. So Mm. interestingly enough, you know, we're doing kind of a lens on on the black experience and black life. But that in that one, we kind of did a lens on whiteness and, and how whiteness becomes and what you know, the cost of it. And it's, so that's also a cool episode if you're interested. Yeah. <laughs> and I love how you do such a wide gamut and, but you bring your knowledge, your, your life experiences. And you were doing also what Bob Law was doing. You are exposing people to things they never knew existed. And it's so very important that you continue to do what you do. It's really important that everyone go to www.thesecolored.com. I'll have links in the the show notes. (laughs) Make sure people know. You need to go to thesecoloredpages.com. You go to their website. From there, you can get everything else. You can get their social links, uh, links to podcasts. You can listen to the podcast right there on the site. Everything is there. You need to go there, and you need to listen to what Marcy and Akko are doing. They are uh, opening up worlds of literature to people, and it is going to make a difference. And what's great is you're helping people who never were being seen be seen, and you're Mm. promoting literature, and you're making it fun. So it's not some dry thing. Uh, (laughs) 
<laughs> some person. <laughs> And the epistle of the override differential is the. No, wow, you're. It's that voice was fun. way too accurate, though. Like, <laughs> <what>? <laughs> it is fun, and at the same time, you drop these nuggets uh, that uh, would make a uh, MFA student jealous, and uh, I am just so grateful to be your book internet podcast friend uh cousin what and all the good things all the terms <laughs> oh my god that we use to show family and you definitely have a friend with me and uh mm. uh and 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 hey folks i've got a plan for another book it's, it's gonna be after we finish all of the jesse um redmond Fawcett's books but there's another book i want to talk about and this book has shenanigans it's satire written by a black yes. person I'm so from the harlem no. renaissance i'm and really excited this <laughs> book nobody is safe everybody no safe. everybody <laughs> gets a jab but i mean i can't think of any two people who can keep the shenanigans going in a book full of shenanigans this is just going to be shenanigans <laughs> oh the- i'm so hyped i'm so hyped <laughs> so yes. definitely uh check out marcy and Ako. marcy Ako, thank you thank you thank you thank you i really really appreciate this uh we we're gonna stop because um uh, we actually have to get back with our lies because we could keep talking for another two hours because this <laughs> could. book made us feel something could. but Right. <laughs> yeah, Marcy and I could do have a life, so I gotta let them go. <laughs> oh my God. You have anything no. you want to say? Anything you want to share with us before we roll out? Um, that we are so happy <laughs> to have met you, and yes. that we like excessively enjoy hanging out with you <laughs> on multiple occasions. And I mean, Curtis was gassing us up, y'all, but I mean, this man has done so much when it comes so to detailing black literature and getting the word out there. And so, check out his website i mean obviously you know it since you're listening to this show but just keep <laughs> listening and we are i mean uh i think you were one of our first collabs curtis yeah so like i think so yeah we, you were one of my first collabs first. you were really yeah. my first collab too so we're we both are first yes. for each other yeah. <laughs> so special bond a joyous thing so absolutely absolutely yeah just just thank you curtis my ch- oh my god i love <laughs> i just Every chance we get to talk to you is just so lovely. So, so thank you. Okay, everyone. You can, if you want to see the show notes that I'm going to have uh, for this episode or all the books we're going to talk about on our journey through the works of Jesse Redmond Fawcett, just go to ifoundthisgreatbook.com slash Jesse, J-E-S-S-I-E. Just go there. That'll take you to the page. From there, you can listen to us again. You can listen right there on the website, or if you want to share it, you can share from there. And then I have three more books with three more great folks. Uh, It's going to be cool. So just keep coming back and uh, definitely join us on this journey. This is going to be fun. Um, There is confusion, and those folks were confused. (laughs) (laughs) everything was confused racism is confused the world is confused uh jesse i i have a new life you know i love some zora new hurston now you know i'm i'm a stand for her but woo, jesse jesse does it so we're definitely gonna enjoy this trip everyone stay safe and have a great reading day